everyone. Um, I am delighted to be part of this amazing panel with these amazing personalities here. Um, before I get to introduce them to you. Um, so innovation is talk of the town and um, every company is talking about it. If you don't innovate, you go extinct. That's what Tom says. And, um, you know, this, this is something is so talked through, but not from inclusion perspective, in my opinion, because... Uh, Mr. Guria, in his speech, talked about how the inequality gap has increased um, over the last generation, 30 to 35 percent. So letting innovation go run wild and take its own course is not helping because we have been never this innovative in the human history. So we will discuss now what can be done to make sure uh, innovation today is also inclusive. So here I have on my left Tom Siebel, and he is the CEO uh, uh, of, um, and chairman of C3.ai. He's a businessman, technologist, and author. In fact, he just signed the book I got of him, his last book. And then we have Eddie Sabara, uh, CEO of Mara Group. And uh, Mara Group is known for um, establishing the first mobile phone factory in Africa, in this case, Rwanda. Um, but, and we have uh, Thierry Dasso, who is the president of the supervisory board of Group Industrial Marcel Dasso. And uh, it is, of course, as you, most of you know, is an aerospace and software conglomerate. Started off during World War I uh, as producer of um, airplane propellers, right? I guess that is correct. And I have uh, Marie-Noelle Sumeria. I'm trying uh, my accent here. So he, she's a group. Chief Technology Officer of Total, and before that, she was the CEO of Atomic Energy Commission. I think um, that says it all. <laughs> okay. Is it working? It's not working. Thank you. Um, so I would like to start with um, first asking uh, Tom about, um, I mean, you have written and you have spoken at length at, uh, on the impacts of digital transformation and uh, the need for organizations to harness cloud computing, big data, AI, Internet of Things. What can be done to ensure the entire global population can in fact benefit from the technologies of the future. Testing one, two. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Okay, so if we look at you know the impact of so we've had Homo sapiens on the planet for I think roughly a hundred thousand years. There's been life on the planet for about three and a half billion years, and we have had a lot of collisions of uh, technology with with Homo sapiens from fire to the domestication of agriculture to the domestication of dogs. Um, you know, more recently, uh, the steam engine, the jacquard loom, the transistor. And, you know, let's look at, a, you, know, you know, kind of recent developments, you know, in the 18th century associated with the steam engine and the jacquard loom that brought on the Industrial Revolution. Now that created a lot of changes and a lot of people who were former weavers became unemployed or people who were uh, driving um, uh, <clears throat> who were in the business of driving you know horse-drawn carriages became unemployed and after that we had the industrial revolution and we had automation and we had factories and we had automobiles so while there were jobs eliminated and I think most people would argue that the Industrial Revolution was a good thing. And I think for every job that was eliminated, you know, between 100 and 1,000 jobs were created. 
And so there will be disruption, there will be people left behind. At the same time, you know, net net from what we're seeing now, um, it will be a job creator. So what is going on now? Uh, I've been in the information technology business for four decades. I am a computer scientist uh, by training and went to work for a startup company called Oracle Corporation. Turned out to be a pretty good idea. And then later started a company called Siebel Systems that where we invented this market that you know of as CRM. And that became also became a large global corporation. And that was a pretty good idea. Okay, so now if we look at the information technology business writ large, in, you know, the transistor was invented in 1948. In 1980, as of 1983, the worldwide market for information technology was about $50 billion. As of today, it's about three and a half trillion. And in five years, it will be nine trillion. So it's accelerating very rapidly. And what are these accelerants? Well, these accelerants are this phenomenon that we call elastic cloud computing that you've heard of from AWS and Microsoft and Google. This, this phenomenon of big data that everybody is aware of. This thing that we call the Internet of Things that we can talk about more if you want to. And then at the convergence of these technologies, we find AI. So artificial intelligence where we're able to use these. So elastic cloud computing gives us infinite computing and storage capacity virtually at no cost. And we apply these with some sciences that have been developed in recent years, you know, I think primarily, well, in the West, okay, that enables us to uh, solve classes of problems that have never been solved before associated with predictive analytics. This is what AI is as it relates to commercial, industrial, and government processes. Classic applications are AI-based predictive maintenance, production optimization, the um, next specs offer, next, next product, fraud detection, what have you. Net net is this is a huge change, okay, in the way that we design products, the way that we manage companies, the way that we, um, the way that we deliver products, the way that we service customers, the way that we manage people, and the way that we train, train our citizens, and the way that we um, uh, govern countries. Um, it will be a huge transition. And there will be people that will be left behind who will not make the transition, and we need to figure out how to deal with that. There will also be negative consequences of these technologies, as there were negative consequences from the Industrial Revolution. I mean, we can draw a straight line between the steam engine and the Jacquard loom and, you know, World War I, World War II, child labor, some pretty bad stuff. Uh, the set net net, the, I think the benefits are pretty significant. So. Long story short, will there be jobs eliminated? Yes. Will people have to learn new skills? Yes. Will we have to think about retraining our people? Yes. Will we have to really think about retraining our citizens? Yes. But for every job that's eliminated, between 100 and 1,000 new jobs will be created. So would you say then we don't have to worry about it? So it will be just fine that new jobs will be created? Or should there be some intervention, can be by governments, can be by people's um, different ways. A good, no, great question. We should be very worried, okay? So let's, we, we should be very worried. So just as I think net-net, most people would argue that the consequences of the Industrial Revolution were positive, there were many unanticipated consequences that most people would consider negative, okay? That brought on World War I, World War II, child labor, you know, Marxism, you know, I could get myself in trouble here, I know, so I'll stop there, okay? And the, okay, now, the, um, um, but associated with what's going on in AI, there are gonna be unintended secondary consequences that are really quite significant, and a lot of them associated with privacy. Uh, let's think about precision medicine. AI, precision medicine will be the largest application of AI. Soon for a population of France or the United States or Germany, we will be able to aggregate the genome sequences, okay, and the healthcare histories of the, of the we can do this today, okay, uh, uh, of the population of France, apply, apply AI to these data, and predict with very high levels of precision who is gonna be diagnosed with what disease in the next five years, say, uh, you be it prostate cancer, or breast cancer, whatever it might be. Well, this gives us the opportunity to share really significantly because we can intervene, uh, that gives us the opportunity to intervene clinically 
okay, and avoid the onset of the disease. We'll, we will have genome-specific medical protocols that'll be highly efficacious in curing these diseases. We will have the ability to, you know, to engage in telemedicine in places where medicine is not available, okay, and cure these people. We'll have, so the kind of, the, the kind of, so this is all goodness in light, right? I mean, people are healthier, they live longer, and, and, and healthcare is cheaper. At the same time, let's think about it. The government of France, or the government of the United States, or the health, or the healthcare insurance company in the United States, I mean, they know which one of us is going to be diagnosed with a terminal disease in the next three years. I mean, do you want to know that? I'm not sure I do. And how are they going to use the, that, those data? Are they going to use it? I mean, you know, the idea that corporations and governments behave, um, you know, ethically and in the best interest of everybody is, I mean, we know that's not true. See Facebook for details. And so, how are these data going to be used? Are they, who cares about pre-existing conditions when we know what you're gonna be diagnosed with in the next five years? Will it be used to set rates? Yes. Will it be used to drive people of healthcare? Yes, okay. Will, it, will economic decisions be made absent regulation? Okay, will, will, um, will it be made, that will it be decided that for a certain person of a certain age, that it's not economically in the interest of the country to provide health care to that person? Yes. So absent regulation, okay, and, and, and government intervention to avoid these highly deleterious and negative consequences before they happen, we will have to live there, and that will not be a very nice place. So I think there's, it's not all goodness and light. I think we will get back to this subject um, I, from different perspectives as well. Um, but Eddie, I would like to ask you, as uh, mentioned, that you have opened uh, Africa's first smartphone producing factory in Rwanda. And how can access to cheap uh, smartphones help boost social welfare and economic growth across the continent, meaning Africa? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon again. Uh, let me start by uh, clarifying uh, one aspect that you mentioned earlier uh, through the introduction. Uh, as much I'm, I'm privileged to be called uh, CEO, but just a small rectification. Uh, the company was founded by uh, a family-owned uh, business, uh, family-owned company. Uh, it was founded by Ashish, uh, who's a very good friend and uh, my boss at the same time. He's the CEO, I'm his managing director for the first manufacturing plant in Rwanda. So the, the passion behind it, and uh, which I'm uh, very much delighted to speak out today, is that it is a model that comes to find solution about affordability and smartphone penetration in uh, developing countries. So when you look at the, the population in Africa, just to, t to name one aspect where I come from, you realize that we are talking about 1.3 uh, uh, billion uh, citizens of Africa. But when you look at smartphone penetration, it's a very big challenge that we have. Why? Number one is affordability. So it's not about just giving a cheap solution. It's about thinking beyond uh, the normal perspective about finding solutions as opposed to be a just a pure manufacturer and giving a box. So what we do and which we believe will definitely make a difference and make us relevant to change the perspective where Africa today could, be, uh, could move from the simple narrative to be a consumer and become a producer is finding solution in terms of giving affordability. And the first thing that we did uh, was to spend much of the time in research and development. The factory has just been opened. We've actually inaugurated the first plant in Rwanda about a month ago and uh, in Durban in South Africa two weeks ago. But we just actually spent about two years just researching and finding solutions. So it's not about just a, a box, as I said, but it's the application and solution that comes with it. So the first thing that uh, will make it interesting to help us penetrate and increase the penetration of smartphone, not only in Africa and, and globally, is 
the security aspect that we've added on that, which is not software-based, but it is on the motherboard, which gives now a different conversation with financial institutions, to name a few, whereby they have some comfort in terms of uh, accompanying us in terms of funding that, that penetration. So instead of having to sell a phone at a certain value uh, within a market where they're struggling about affordability, but they have alternative way that it could be paid in a period of time. But at the same time, we want to make an interesting story and to say, same as uh, we have uh, the large brand in Asia, in America, in Europe, it is also time for Africa to also say that we can deliver, we can do something, and which still opens us to be part of the globalization. We are global citizens today, we can't uh, keep ourselves just in Africa or in Rwanda or in Kenya, we are citizens of the world. So now what we are doing is, now this is the time through uh, a lot of effort and research and development, we can actually also encourage innovation. So what we've done, as much as we are producing smartphones, we, ha we are interacting with various innovators in the digital world, in Africa and elsewhere, whereby they can actually use our phones as a vehicle where we can actually encourage innovation and give opportunity to so many to actually bring solutions, which comes now and makes a difference in the medical sphere, in the agricultural sphere. We have various projects that are uh, up to completion, and some have been on testing phase for the last six months, we, and even transportation, which seems to be very, very phenomenal. So having, uh, you know, produce uh, more accessible mobile phones, um, you know, this is great. And I think uh, this is going to most probably contribute. But how will you overcome technological literacy, you know, that is being much lower in emerging economies? Um, so how, how, will, how will this be overcome? Uh, it, that's very true. That's uh, one challenge, but uh, face of any challenges, there's also an opportunity. So the way we look at it, the perfect model is a PPP. We are looking at a, a public-private partnership, whereby uh, a government institution will set policies that encourage also private investors to go to invest into education. When you look at uh, vice companies, one of the uh, sector which costs a lot of money is actually research and development. And when you're talking about a startup, we fear that part because it's painful and it delays any return on investment. And when you look at it, uh, we don't have the muscles to wait for 20 years maturity, so we look at alternative ways. And this is where it's very important that we have flows of discussion with government institutions around the world and in Africa as well, whereby they set policies that encourage and gives uh, opportunity to, for private companies also to, have, uh, to see an interest in investing in education. Then we will be transferring skills and making sure uh, as much as we are moving and we want to remain part of the digital world, and it's important that we invest in that. So skills is key, because you see, uh, we are talking about innovation today, as much as you can be a great innovator, but it's a continuous exercise. It doesn't stop that day. You have to keep on thinking beyond and completely out of the box to maintain and remain uh, relevant. Thank you. Um, Thierry Dasso, and um, Dasso is uh, progressive in many areas. Uh, from the use of alternative fuels to mobility solutions, why is sustainable, inclusive technology important for your company? Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Um, I will speak in French. So, um, the technology inclusive it's for everybody and uh, nobody will be uh, sur le bord de la route et ça je pense que c'est très très important que tout le monde soit sur le même bateau et que tout le monde en, en profite j'investis moi-même personnellement dans différents projets euh, de technologie je dis pas haute technologie mais en tout cas de technologie qui pourrait marcher dans le futur parce que c'est du capital risque et mon voisin sera sûrement intéressé, nous verrons tout à l'heure. 
j'ai euh, participé à la création d'une société qui s'appelle YoScrib, qui développe euh, des contenus numériques pour les tablettes et les téléphones à usage euh, éducatif. Et on a de, des contrats de plus en plus importants, notamment en Afrique avec euh, la société de téléphonie Orange. Et ça, c'est sympa. Euh, alors, est-ce que mon appareil à attraper la, les moustiques est inclusif En tout cas, euh, j'espère qu'on va sauver aussi beaucoup de vies, et notamment, malheureusement, encore en Afrique, avec toutes les maladies qui sont véhiculées par les, par les moustiques. Et tout à l'heure, j'ai eu la chance de discuter 2 minutes 30 avec le président de la République démocratique du Congo, qui, évidemment, était intéressé. Donc, inclusion, oui. Euh, je sais qu'il y aura peut-être une question, mais je peux en parler. Au niveau du, du personnel... Euh, des entreprises, il est évident que euh, ce qu'a fait euh, d'abord mon grand-père, puis mon père, avec la participation qui permet à chaque employé de récolter une part des bénéfices, et chez Dassault Aviation, certaines années, ça peut être deux mois de salaire supplémentaire. Donc les bénéfices sont partagés en, en trois, un tiers pour euh, l'entreprise au niveau de la R&D, la recherche et développement, un tiers pour les actionnaires, et un tiers pour les ouvriers. Une petite histoire dans l'histoire, mon grand-père avait donné en 1935, avant le Front populaire de 1936, une semaine de congés payés, avant tout le monde. Et quand les ouvriers sont venus et lui ont dit ben « maintenant il nous en faut deux », il a dit ben « non, je vous en ai donné une, vous en avez une ». Et finalement, ils ont eu leurs deux, leurs deux semaines, et je pense qu'un employé, j'aime pas parler du terme « Ouvriers dans, aux avions, on les appelle plutôt des, des compagnons, et je trouve que c'est un très joli titre. Quand les compagnons sont contents, ils travaillent bien, et il n'y a, a évidemment pas de grève, et tout le monde se porte bien. So, would you say, uh, I will ask in English, I understand, but I can't speak it. So, would you say, um, uh, it is part of uh, corporate culture, and it should be part of corporate culture, the inclusive uh, approach. Sure. Oui, oui, vous avez raison, ça fait partie de nos gènes et on le développe. Et moi, quand je visite une usine, euh, bah, je passe plus de temps avec les compagnons qu'avec les, avec les ingénieurs. Et une fois, d'ailleurs, on était à Bordeaux et tout le monde était parti et allait déjeuner quelque part. Enfin, c'était à 200 mètres. Hein. Et moi, j'étais encore avec les, avec les compagnons. Mais je pense que c'est la base, c'est le dialogue social. C'est aussi à travers la participation d'informer les, les employés de ce qui se passe, bien ou, ou moins bien. On est tous, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, sur le même bateau. Merci. Um, so Marie Noël, um, so you joining Total already, I think, shows so much about Total Total's. Um, policies or Tatal's approach to um, technology. Uh, can you tell us uh, how, um, you know, over the years, um, technology changed Total, not only from efficiency and competitiveness, but from inclusion point of view? You're right that technology is part of the solution, but not only. Uh, I will say that innovation, it's much more than just technology because it brings something new to people, which is the core business of every industry. So let's come back to the raison d'être of Total. So the raison d'être is really to provide the energy to uh, people who need uh, this energy. And remember that there, there is still one billion inhabitants on the planet with no access to energy. And that's the demand of energy is increasing more than 2% per, per year. But providing energy is not enough now because people are expecting much more. There is a great awareness uh, related to uh, climate change. And so it's a commitment to be able to provide a safer, affordable, and cleaner energy. So it's Uh, the ambition of Total to be a major of responsible energy, this responsibility lies in this world. So technology uh, or innovation 
is playing a great role. We uh, profoundly believe that in order to uh, tackle the challenge of climate change, uh, we have to combine uh, gas, which emits as greenhouse less than coal to, to produce electricity, so gas with renewable energies, promoting a frugal use of oil, just when we, we can't avoid the usage of oil. Biofuel could be an alternative, especially for transportation. And we have also to contribute to carbon neutrality. So we invest a lot in R&D. One billion dollar in 2018. And two thirds of, of, of uh, this uh, uh, amount of investment is dedicated to low carbon energy and digital. So let's just give an example of uh, the type of technology which can be a game changer. If we're considering low carbon energy, so beyond renewable energies, so we promote and we want to be leader uh, to develop carbon capture, usage and storage. Because there is no other choice to reach uh, carbon neutrality in the second half of the century. And we have to store or to find solution with CO2 at a gigaton. So it's, it's really a huge, huge industrial issue that we, we have to, uh, to, to, to cope with. So we dedicate 10% of the overall R&D budget of total in order to develop, to promote this technology. Not alone, because we need to be with other partners. So it's part of the OGCI mission to promote the CC, what we call CCUS, for this type of technology. And we invest a lot, between one and two billion dollars per year in low carbon electricity, just to change the global portfolio of uh, energy portfolio of Total to, to mitigate uh, this portfolio. So I, I feel like because it's an energy company, of course, the subject uh, always comes to green energy. That's, you know, the, because that is one of the areas, of course, a lot of all the energy companies are working towards. When I think, when I think of inclusion, of course, green, green energy, the carbon emissions is part of it. Like, for instance, uh, energy is dominantly male, right? I mean, for instance, inclusion, when I say inclusion, that is not only fragile economies, I love that term somebody used, you know, fragile economies being included in the global economy, or like women, or who, are, who weren't, uh, you know, uh, naturally or um, originally part of the economy, being part of the economy. So in total, do you see this happening? Uh, uh, with, of course, technology, we, uh, we somehow assume it will be so inclusive, yet it is not yet. It is not. It is not including everyone. The gap is growing. Um, of course, oil, uh, you know, the, how do you see this changing in total? Um, as an oil company... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I will answer to, to fall in two, in two ways. Uh, first of all, uh, I see a, a great change in the company because the world of energy is moving, so we have to move, we have to innovate, we have to think about uh, what people are expecting in terms of usage of energy. And it's inclusive. There is no other choice to uh, listen and to understand what people uh, are expecting in terms of usage of energy for transportation, for their life. And we, we have just to provide the energy that our customers wanted to use. So uh, inclusion of customers, but customers, uh, it's, it's us. It's obvious, there is no other choice. Internally, what we can see is that thanks to artificial intelligence, thanks to digitalization, there's a great opportunity for the company to implement much more new services. And new services 
uh, bring us in other domain. So we are no more a pure oil and gas company, but we are moving to a global integrated energy company, integrating part of the portfolio in low carbon uh, energy. And so developing electricity businesses or transportation businesses are linking together mobility uh, and uh, energy, energy. So it's open new scope of, uh, of innovation with people, with customers, and including communities in all the countries where we have businesses. So I would like to extend this question to everyone, actually. How can innovation and technology promote inclusion at the societal level? So um, I think uh, we can start with Tom, with you. How, how can this happen? Well, <clears throat> I think it's inevitable. I mean, it's not all good, but it's inevitable. I mean, if we look at, you know, artificial intelligence, for example, which is one of the, you know, really significant developments of the 21st century. It wasn't really invented in the 21st century, but it certainly is taking off in the 21st century. Um, there's, you know, you, you can look at, you know, AI, I think is divided into three categories. Like they used to say, I think Julius Caesar said, Gaul was divided into three parts. This is the way I look at AI. And, you know, in the first category is this category that they call AGI, which is uh, artificial general intelligence. And this would be like the deep mind project at Google and this idea that we're gonna create computers that are smarter than human beings. And this has to do with the, in the malevolent computer, the smart refrigerator that's gonna take over your house. And uh, you know, I don't think we need to worry about that anytime soon. Uh, the second category of AI where it's broadly applied is by the social media companies uh, that are using AI to manipulate people, say 2.2 billion people at a time at the level of the limbic brain. And uh, I think this is uh, becoming, you know, in really, really troubling in terms of, you know, the uh, public health uh, consequences this is having. I think, um, you, know, uh, actually, you know, in terms of people's self-image, depression, suicide, um, the, the weaponization of these systems where we have bad actors who are uh, weaponizing these systems, making it questioning about whether you can, you know, it's possible to conduct a democracy or not. And this is an open question in the United States. We have this, all this foment going on over Brexit. Well, a lot of this is fueled by bad actors from, you know, from, from, from foreign countries and manipulating social media. You know, the third, the third, and you know, so this, this affects everybody, you know, 2.2 billion people today and, and growing. The third application of AI relates to, you know, industrial, commercial, precision health, travel, transportation, aerospace, defense intelligence, smart cities, the administration of government that will affect us all. So I think for better or for worse, it is gonna be inclusive and there's nobody who's gonna be untouched. Many of the consequences will be positive, some will be negative, and those that are negative are where government needs to step in and do, what, do its job and regulate. Uh, yes, I, um, I have uh, read a few um, of our, our, the, your interviews and you talk about uh, you know, um, how uh, you, pro you, s how you support the efforts uh, GDPR on GDPR and, and I'm, of course, you're American, so you, that question was going to come to you. So what will U.S. do about it? Because as it is, as you were saying, you know, having a, a social media account does not actually make you so much included that makes you maybe be a tool if, you're, if it is not monitored. Well, I think that Europe is definitely taking the lead in this and what it's doing with GDPR and what it's doing with the right to be forgotten is absolutely a step in the right direction. And so th these are good things. So Europe was ahead of this. Um, I think it really did, and we didn't really get a lot of attention to this in the United States until uh, kind of this really perverse reaction that we saw out of Facebook to the, um, the Russians' penetration of Facebook during the 
uh, the last uh, 2016 election cycle. And you know they then engaged in this disinformation campaign where Cheryl was leaned in uh, in kind of a very malevolent way and uh, where they, they engage in a disinformation campaign against sitting members of government. Well, those sitting members of government are not amused. And you know, some of these people, like Senator Mark Warner from Virginia, uh, who happens to be a Democrat and others, I think this issue has gotten their attention and they're getting very focused on social media. So I think we are gonna see, it's very clear that we have these social media companies today that are more powerful than the governments that regulate them. And, and, but in the United States, I think they have, uh, they have kind of uh, really rattled a hornet's nest and the Congress is turning on them and they're gonna fix this. So hope, and I'm certain there'll be cooperation from Europe in this. As it relates to China, I mean, that's just a complete lost cause and uh, as, it, as it relates to social media. So that I think is uncontrollable, but. Uh, thank you. Um, so Eddie, I would like, uh, would you like to comment on this? What do you think, uh, how we can use innovation to promote inclusiveness? Yes, uh, uh, just uh, to add and uh, actually agree what he said earlier is that uh, it's inevitable. Innovation and technology is actually is going hand for hand. When you look at it, it's just not later than yesterday, I met uh, one of the delegates, Mutaga, uh, who came for the same conference and was staying at the same hotel, and he was explaining to me his brilliant and beautiful innovation in terms of e-learning. So you see, this is already innovation, but again, you need technology behind it. So you can't boost and reach mass market without technology. So it's, it goes in hand. Obviously, this security aspect comes in it, and uh, these various parameters, you don't, have a, you don't want to create social shocks as well, because this is why it is also flexi flexible. We have to be uh, not resistant to changes, but to be adjustable and make sure that uh, as much as innovation is created within our society, but these uh, systems and technology behind it that accompany it in the best way and the safest way. Uh, to give you another example is um, when I look at uh, uh, digital transformation today, smartphone penetration, which is a field that I'm very, very much comfortable with. Uh, if I look at today, if I need to ask for a new passport from my cell phone, uh, I actually make a request online. It, I download and send my pictures. I use my virtual uh, account and access to my bank account, pay for that for the passport, and you get a notification from the immigration in the next uh, couple of hours to say if any document is missing or it's been approved. And you just need to go and straight you get it. These various projects that come also, this is also innovation, but it's well supported by technology. Look into the medical sphere. Uh, there's a project that has been uh, growing very fast in Africa called Babel. Babel is actually using uh, smartphones to be able to uh, encourage uh, consultation, doctors' consultations uh, at an early stage where uh, people in a very deep rural areas need medical attention and they can actually have a consultation online. And this is, and this is all part of technology backing innovation to make it an interesting aspect. And it goes far, far beyond that. Agricultural industries are now using platform to sell, buy, purchase, and so on. So I will say we shouldn't shy away from it. And uh, it's actually good that technologies keep on growing, but also innovation should actually take, uh, will be encouraged when uh, there's already an ecosystem and a dynamic around it that allows uh, us to work in pair. Uh, Mr. Dasso, would you like to comment on this? <laughs> no. <laughs> no? <laughs> Different. No, I think what I say, et uh, donc, um, sur, sur le projet de, de Uscrib, là, pour l'éducation, euh, j'ai pas inventé, mais ça semble tellement logique, c'est-à-dire euh, apprendre aux jeunes, c'est finalement leur permettre euh, d'avoir un métier et de sortir de la pauvreté. Donc on sort de la pauvreté, c est, c est, je ne dis pas qu'on inverse l'inclusion, mais comme pour la machine à moustiques, si on attrape beaucoup de moustiques et qu'il y a moins de, de porteurs de, de maladies, fièvre jaune et, et autres, on leur, on leur aura sauvé la vie. 
Donc ça, je crois que c'est intéressant. Sur, sur l'intelligence euh, artificielle, moi, je vais juste donner deux, deux petits exemples qui vont vous faire rire, je pense. Une voiture à conduite autonome s'arrête à un panneau, stop, arrêt, et redémarre immédiatement, et s'arrête à 3 mètres plus tard. Je ne vais pas vous demander de, de me donner la réponse, forcément, mais elle est finalement assez simple, puisque c'est un ouvrier qui avait le panneau sur l'épaule, et qui s'est arrêté, et qui a avancé. Donc ça, on ne peut pas forcément le, le, le prévoir. Euh, autre chose, mon épouse, euh, avec l'Apple, elle euh, appuie sur la touche, euh, Siri, euh, qu'est-ce que vous voulez, euh, je veux rien, euh, et quasiment Siri sort, euh, parce qu'elle a dit un gros mot après que je ne vous citerai pas, mais Siri sort quand même, soyez poli. Alors, c'est pas bizarre, c'est en tout cas étonnant. Donc, l'inclusion, c'est récupérer tout le monde sur le bord de la route. Et puis, on n'a pas forcément parlé des personnes handicapées. Je crois que c'est extrêmement important. Quand je vais dans une entreprise et que la loi fait, bah, tant mieux qu'il y ait une ou deux personnes en, en mobilité réduite ou, on va dire, un peu, un peu différente, bah, je me dis, au moins, on a fait quelque chose. Et je vois, j'ai un ami qui a une... Une jeune fille qui est différente, ça a été bien difficile au début, il y a quelques années, pour qu'elle puisse être accompagnée dans une classe. Maintenant, ça se fait, mais quel combat Donc, incluons aussi les, les handicapés. Et uh, Marie-Noël Oui, je pense que l'industrie qui joue un grand rôle Uh, to combine technology, innovation, inclusion, for sure. But we have to play a great role in the society too, in order to be sure that everybody is on board. And for example, uh, we decided to create an école de l'industrie uh, for young people uh, who are outside the education system. So it's, it's really key to take care of the next generation, especially young people who are out of uh, some education system today. It's our future, so it's really our duty uh, to open uh, a way for them to contribute uh, to the society and to uh, uh, the wellness of everybody and for them too. Um, so Tom, I don't know if this is urban legend, but I heard that anyone in your company who would like to do a technology degree would be given 25 grand. <laughs> so we are an information technology company in Silicon Valley, and we're called C3AI, and we're involved in the development of artificial intelligence, and we hire about 65% of our employees have graduate degrees from a coal polytechnic or MIT or wherever. Now, today, th this field is moving so fast that you know, three months after you graduated from MIT or a coal polytechnic, you're technologically obsolete. So we, we've developed a curriculum in new technologies from this online learning organization called uh, Coursera in elastic cloud computing, Kubernetes, AI, deep learning, machine learning, neural networks, what have you. And all of our employees are encouraged to go take these courses. Everybody who gets a certificate uh, in these courses and the receptionist has taken a, has taken a course in, in machine learning. Well, you get a, a bonus of $2,500 you get your wall, you get a plaque on this, you know, learning, continuous learning hall of fame in headquarters, and you're featured in the company newsletter that week. If you want to get a master's degree in computer science or a master's degree in data science, say, and they have an online master's program at the uh, University of Illinois at Urbana, which is one of the top computer schools in the United States. And so if someone wants to get, an, uh, wants to get a master's degree, we pay the tuition, We pay the fees, we pay all the expenses, and when you get your advanced, your advanced degree, we pay you a $25,000 cash award, you get a 15% increase in salary, 
and you get a stock award at the company. So it's very much a core part of our culture is continuous education of our workforce. And as we go, say, from 400 people today to 4,000 people in three years, I think this will be a form of sustainable competitive advantage. Now, all of you will do this too. I mean, this is, this is what you will need to do to compete in the 21st century. And either you can replace your workforce or you can train your workforce. And I strongly recommend that the latter is the more preferable of the two alternatives. But I think that, yes, this is very much part of the culture at C3. And it's not urban legend, it's fact. And whatever we paid in those bonuses at the company, which is now in millions is, is the, of dollars, is uh, the most effective dollars that we have spent. Uh, wonderful. So, um, um, Mr. Tasso, I have this question for you. Um, since you have the largest number of employees among us here today, on the podium at least, 26,000, do you see this sort of initiative viable for you? Do you have similar initiatives? Possible, je ne sais pas encore, mais c'est une c'est une excellente idée. Mais, mais je pense que de toute façon, on donne on donne leur chance à tous les à tous les employés de, de gravir des, des échelons. Alors il n'y a peut-être pas des primes aussi importantes, mais je vais me renseigner. Uh, Marie Noël, um, this question is my favorite, and I, I have to ask before you finish. Um, where do you see Total in 50 years? In 50 years, it's quite a long way. <laughs> I, may, I may answer that uh, for sure, part of uh, the global portfolio of Total will change. We are committed to uh, provide at least 15%, between 15 and 20% of low carbon electricity. Uh, but I think that perhaps uh, the right answer would be that uh, uh, Total has to, to be exactly where uh, the customers are expecting a global energy company to be. And it's really our role, and especially as a CTO, to help the company making the right choice, opening the right tracks, and contributing in the company and outside the company to uh, a society of pedagogy where we are able to speak about what we are doing, the right challenge, the right figures. We can't change the world overnight, but we have this responsibility for the future generation. Thank you. Great. Um, so for, I see zero, zero here, should I be finishing? Okay. <laughs> I was just not taking the cues. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and it was uh, a pleasure. And I hope uh, some of you found some answers uh, with these uh, questions all answered. I still am, um, you know, curious to see how this whole innovation is going to change our world to be more inclusive. But uh, thank you so much for your time.